Philippians chapter uh, 4, we're beginning in the first verses is where we'll be uh, in this uh, text today. And, and I just want to say before I jump in um, that to say the same things to you is no trouble to me <laughs> and, and it's safe for you. And I, there's a reason why I'm saying that. And if you read quickly and just look quickly at what the topic is or what the thrust of these verses is, you're going to quickly see, oh, we're talking about unity again. Yes, we're talking about unity again. And, and the reality is, is it's no trouble for me to talk to you about unity again because, well, we talk about unity a lot. In fact, at a church where we emphasize unity, if you look at the, the, the vision, mission statements of the, uh, of the way church, worship and lead others to worship, the primary reason that we exist is both worship and mission. Worshiping, honoring the Lord with our whole life and expressing that worship in such a way that others can see his glory and join us in worshiping him. Worship and lead others to worship. The very next phrase. Unite as a family in Christ, right? Like this, this idea, worship and unity. These things go hand in hand. In fact, worship and you know, unity is so, such a big deal. Jesus at one time tells his followers, if you're something between you and your brother, if you have something with your brother, go and correct that before you come and offer your sacrifice because unity is such a clear and consistent issue. So it's not, not a problem for me to talk about unity again. And it's safe for you. It keeps us safe. In fact, this is the way we learn. Repetition is the way we learn. So, so there's this reality that we get to sit down, think about it again. We have the opportunity, though, not just to look at the same old things we've always been saying, but just see a different, a different perspective. Uh, unity in the church is, is it's like most other doctrines and most other applications of the gospel. There's a number of facets to it. It's like a diamond. You can talk about it here, and then as we come at it from another perspective, we get to see another facet of it. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to read four, uh, Philippians 4, chapters one or verses 1 through 3, and then we will pray, and then we'll dig in and see what the Lord has for us today. So, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown... Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Eodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Let's pray. Father, I do ask that, that uh, well, I know that we're not going to learn all there is to know about uniting as your children in this one setting. But I do pray that you would just continue to, to knock away the selfish ambition, the self-exaltation, the individuality that is so uh, per, per, pervasive and, well, persuasive that we long for ourselves and Good of, good of ourselves. And so I just pray that you'd help us in a healthy way, not to run to codependency or to some unhealthy version uh, uh, that, that's just tearing down you. Help us, Father, be a people who, who reflect the, the work that you're doing and who reflect the union that we now have with Christ in everyday life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So from all that Paul has said, concluding in the, in the chapter before, he comes to this place where we almost get this hinge uh, uh, transitional verse, therefore, my brother. So he's drawing on all that he said about the value of Jesus, about everything else being lost, uh, uh, about, about um, imitating him uh, and, and pursuing Christ at all costs. He's, he's drawing from all of that, and then he's saying, therefore, my brothers... And he's, he, he takes a pause before he gets to the therefore, to, to what, what he's about to point at. And he wants to remind them, I love you. I have deep affection for you. You mean so much to me. This, this isn't the first time he's done that. It start, the letter starts that way. Like he's already reminded them of what they mean to them. And I love this because, because on the surface, as we, as we approach the book of Philippians, Philippians is such a powerfully positive letter. Like it is filled with his love and his affection. It's filled with joy. In fact, one of the major themes of the book of Philippians is joy. On the surface, as you approach it, it seems as, oh man, this is such a positive 
letter. It's such a pleasure to read, such a pleasure to teach. But there's a dark undercurrent. There's, there's, there's a way in which I'm about to tell you something that's difficult for you to hear, that's difficult to apply, but I want you to know I'm doing it because I love you so deeply. And so he comes to this place where he says, I love you. I, I, I long for you. I, I, you are a joy to me. You, you are a, 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 a realization or a reflection of God's fruitful work in my life. Stand firm. Don't give up any ground. Keep fighting the good fight. If you go back to the, to the first passages, to the, to the opening verses, he tells them to live a life worthy of the gospel. Because underneath all this positivity, all this powerful uh, positive perspective, all of this, underneath all of it is the reality that these people are living in a very difficult circumstance, a very difficult place. All the positivity is because he is so heavily focused on so valuing over everything else. He is so committed to Jesus Christ. He can't help but rejoice because Jesus Christ is proclaimed. He can't help but rejoice because Jesus Christ is his greatest treasure and everything else that he could potentially lose. He considers trash in contrast to the, to, to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. But he knows these people are living in just as difficult a place, just a diff- as difficult a season, just as difficult a circumstance as he is. And, and, and I appreciate this because it's so real. It is so real. We could talk about all the good things. In fact, probably every conversation that happened just a minute ago. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm doing good too. I'm here. I'm still breathing. Still, I, There's a, a phrase that gets said pretty often to me to, by, by a friend in the church. I'm still sucking air. <laughs> right? I'm doing good. But there's a different reality that's happening inside and in our lives, right? Like if you just consider where we've been for the last few years and the undercurrent of our life and the undercurrent of the circumstances and situations and seasons that we've all lived through. I mean, we have been pressed on every side. Politically, it is one of the most tense seasons as a church leader. Now, I've not been a church leader but about 15 years, so, so I don't know what it was like 50 years ago. I don't know what it was exactly like when Paul was alive. I don't, I don't know. All I know is that in this 15 years, the last two have been the most contentious and hardest to lead through because we are so heavily influenced politically that sometimes we value that over, over our connection in Christ. I'm not saying everyone does. I'm not saying that. You, I'm just saying that it happens. And so politically, we've been pressed on. Sociologically, all the conversations about race and racism, pandemic perspectives, you throw in the mix at this, I don't know, this new virus starts circulating and nobody knows anything about it. And everybody, everybody kind of reacts the same way at the very beginning, fear. Like, I don't want to get it. I don't want to die from it. I don't and then we start fracturing. And that fracture didn't just exist outside the church. That fracture existed inside the church. It happened with, among God's people. We have been pressed on every side. But not once have we lost our reason to rejoice. Now, oftentimes we're not. But the reason to rejoice is still there. As a church, we have endured in, internal conflict. We have lost some of the dearest friends that we have known in this church over the course of this last year and a half, a year. That's been extremely difficult. Many of you continue to endure difficulty in your own personal lives that the rest of us don't even know about, that's pressing on you, that's not pressing on us. But we have the same exact reasons to rejoice in the midst of the difficult days and the dark season. We have the exact same reasons to be positive as Paul and these people in Philippi. So Paul, he, he sees it. And I agree, none, none, none of this is enough. 
None of this that we've endured, none of the darkness that is under the undercurrent of life in this world, none of it is enough to rob us of the joy of knowing Jesus, of having Jesus' righteousness, and pursuing Jesus' resurrection at all costs. None of it is enough if we'll just keep our eyes on Jesus, if we'll just stand firm. And so because he loves them, because he cares so much for them, He's not going to say the easy thing and say, well, you know, it's okay that you're struggling. It's okay that life is hard and you're wallowing in that victim identity or you're wallowing in that pain and suffering or that you're, I, I'm using strong language. I, I, I'm trying to draw a point, just hyperbo- hyperbole a little bit. I recognize that when things hit, it, it takes a minute to get our bearing, right? I understand. But when that becomes the source of our identity and begins us to rob us of the joy You're going to hear Paul say, you're going to hear a pastor who loves you say, stand firm in the Lord. Not because it's the easy thing to say. Because I'd much rather just sit down with you in the middle of it and not confront you or call you out in your own junk. Well, I just found out that I've been being lied to by this person for years. Yeah, that's hard. Let's talk about that. Let's deal with that. But there's going to come a time where I'm going to say, why aren't you still looking at Jesus? Why are you allowing your, their sin to rob you of the joy of walking with Jesus? This is what he does because he loves these people so much. And what's funny, though, is Paul doesn't first turn to joy. He doesn't, he, he doesn't say, stand firm in the Lord and rejoice. He's going to. That's the verse next week that we're going to start out with. He's going to get there. But his very first application of standing firm in the Lord is, Is what? I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. We cannot stand firm in the Lord and be at odds with one another. It's not possible. Unity in the church isn't optional. It's not something we can have, take or leave. Oh, well, you know, I don't like anybody in the church. And I don't care if there's division between us and... Forget all that. I'm getting what I need. I can go and listen to Seth. If, if all you're getting from this church is my preaching, I'm sorry. I, we have so much more to offer. And it's right there. It's every one of you have something to offer the other brothers and sisters in Christ and those we don't yet know who will either come to know Christ by his work in our lives and through our lives or who will be blessed as brothers and sisters in Christ in his work, in our lives and through our lives. Unity in the church is not optional. He he does not see it as optional. The very first way in which he applies, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved, is be united, stand together. And it's not just an issue of, 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 of you two figure it out. He calls the whole church to this issue. He calls people into the problem. And then the way it all works together, the way the language flows, the way the thought flows, there is only one way in doing this. There's only one way to arrive at this. The only path in this life to rejoicing together in the church is standing firm in and agreeing in the Lord. The only path in this life to rejoicing together in the church is standing firm and agreeing in the Lord. The only way to be united is stand firm and agree in the Lord. Now, I mentioned it earlier, this, Paul's mention of unity. This isn't the first time he's brought this up, right? That's why I opened with saying, hey, to say the same things to you is no trouble to me. It's safe for you. This isn't the first time he's brought it up. This is a major theme through this letter. That's why I titled the whole series Rejoicing Together. So many people focus on the joy component, and it is a major theme. Joy is a major theme. But that joy is always connected somehow. Everything Paul says is somehow affected by, influenced by his understanding that unity in the church is absolutely necessary. Philippians 1.7. I, I, I don't have these verses on the screen. I figure you got your Bibles. You can flip over real quickly and easily if you want. Philippians 1.7. It's right for me to feel this way about you. He's, he's just talking about how he feels. Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and defense and confirmation of the gospel. He doesn't mention the word unity there, does he? No, there's no unity in that 
But his emphasis, their partnership, their participation together with him in God's grace and in God's mission. It is Christian unity being expressed. Philippians 1, 17, referring to people who are preaching Christ with, with bad motive. He says, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So he doesn't just deal with the fact that there's a necessity of Christian unity. He's dealing with the fact that he's being afflicted by Christian people, or at least professing Christians. People who are out there preaching the right message, they're preaching Christ, but they're doing it out of selfish ambition and looking to cause him trouble. So he's not addressing just one side of it. He's addressing both sides of it. Philippians 1, 27, he's going to deal with it a little bit more directly. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you. Now, this is going to sound very similar. That you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. The fellowship, that, that, that the koinonia that he's referencing back in Philippians 1, 7, the partakers of grace, the partners in the, in the gospel, that koinonia, he is calling what, what's been provided by God's grace, he's calling them to now practice in life. Standing firm in one spirit, experiencing and partaking in the one spirit, so participating in and partaking of this one mind, striving side by side, participating in and partaking in the grace of God that leads us to live his mission. And then if you follow that line of thought, he immediately turns to chapter two. He did, well, he didn't turn to chapter two because he didn't put those in there. But the, he, he turns around and, and says it directly, complete my joy. I'm not even able to have the fullest joy I could have If there's division among you, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And again, drawing from this idea that we're participants and partakers of God's grace, drawing from this idea that we have the same purposes and the same mission, and then to set, to to just illustrate that as fully as he can, he uses Jesus and his humble service and his willingness to to consider the interests of others over himself as the example for the mind that he's calling us to put on. Woven into all that he has been writing through the whole letter and all that will play out in this letter, woven into all that he is writing in Philippians is the theme of unity. Do we need to talk about unity again? Now it's, an, it, it's interesting, the number of conversations now. I, I, think, I think this happens. I can't guarantee it happens. But I think it happens that somebody sits down and talks to me and they think that they've had the idea. But I hear these things. I, the things I use in, in sermons are often things I've heard from three, four, five people. And, and so um, do, do we need to continue to deal with unity? I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> Why wouldn't we want to talk about unity? It's so important to the Christian life. The reason I qualified that just a second ago is because I'm thinking of the people who will listen to this or who are sitting in this room and who've asked me that question. I'm not trying to call you out. You're just not alone. The, the culture in which we live says that we're supposed to exist for ourselves and our families or we take care of the, our four no more and everybody else takes care of their four no more and then we all get along just fine. If you'll just get up and do what you're supposed to do, And then we begin to disregard those outside of our immediate focus. But Paul calls the whole church to this this perspective of standing as one people. And he comes to this passage. And and, and, and this this is hard for us, I think, probably to, to consider. But he doesn't ask their permission so far as we know. Hey, do you mind if I air your dirty laundry in front of the church? I'm going to write this letter. Can I use your name? He calls out two ladies who somehow he's heard about. I don't know if it's because the problem is so difficult or because he knew them so well and he he asked specifically. I I don't know how he finds out about Yodia and Syntyche. But he wants these people. He loves them so deeply. He wants them to stand firm together, to stand firm as God's one people. 
He wants them so clearly to do this that he doesn't even say, Hey, Yodia and Syntyche, fix your problem. He says, Church, help Yodia and Syntyche agree. He doesn't ask their permission not only to use their name. He doesn't ask their permission to say, Hey, I'm going to send some people into your life to mess with your stuff. Because unity in the church is so primary, is of such primary importance in God's church. It robs us of the joy that we can have. We saw that in Philippians 2. If we won't stand together in the Lord. Let, let this, and, and here's, we don't, we don't even know what their problem was, right? We don't know if they had a doctrinal issue with one another. We don't know if there's some methodological issue going on. Maybe Iodia had borrowed some flour and just hadn't brought it back yet. Or maybe it was Syntyche. I don't, we don't know whether it was a petty issue, a big issue. We just don't know. Now, that I've, known, I've read a lot on this now. and There's plenty of people out there making it. We don't even get a clue from the context of this letter that's firm enough for me to feel confident to even bring it up here. We just don't know what's going on. And for us to try to import some idea, I think we do a disservice to, the, to, to what's happening here. I, I think more than anything, we should let this serve as a warning. These women are mature. As far as we can tell, they're mature believers. At a minimum, they're not brand new believers. They have served with Paul at some point in the gospel. They are ministers, have ministered alongside with him. They're not brand new Christians. and it's to, in, in their own right, they are mature believers. So let this serve as a warning to us. It can happen. Even here. Even with us. Even in this room. Do we need to talk about unity still? Say the same things to you is no trouble to me. It's safe for you. The perspective that we would draw out today, that I would seek to draw out today, is the only path in this life to rejoicing together in this type of unity in the church is by standing firm in and agreeing in the Lord. We need to recognize that though, that, that, that though we are Christians and maturing Christians and growing in Christ together, we need to recognize that the sinful nature that we've been saved from is still seeking to have its way. Disunity. Disunity is the d- default condition in the world because of its rejection of the Lord. And if we're not careful, it will be the default condition even of God's people if we don't listen to what he has to say. Disunity is the default condition in the world because of it, its rejection of the Lord. Self-centeredness, selfish ambition, self-exaltation. It's presented as noble and mighty, like I'm going to take care of myself. I, I, I saw a thing from a, a lady this week that said, I don't care about being selfish. I'm finally, I'm finally picking myself over everybody else. Now, I don't know her well enough, and I'm not con- closely enough connected, but I just wanted to ask her when, she's, when, when did she ever pick anybody else? Chances are she never did to the degree she thought she was. This is the default. If, if you become selfish, you probably were already selfish. That's the natural inclination of every person's heart. We always consider our interests more significant than another's. That's the default operating system of every person who has ever lived. And it comes to that naturally. We don't have to teach that. We don't have to train people. It's just who we are. It goes all the way back to to Genesis. Adam and Eve and their fall into sin. Disunity, division happened immediately in the midst of a harmonious, peaceful existence. It happened immediately when sin entered the world. So look at it, Genesis 3. These verses are on the screen, so you don't have to flip over to it. But, but I would encourage you to just go back and consider this. And the implications of this are much further than just division and disunity. But clearly division and disunity are part of it. Genesis 3, 6 through 8. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that's the tree that they were told not to eat from, it was a delight to the eyes it was, it, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and ate. So guys, I know we like to crack the joke. Man, I can't believe Eve. She ruined everything for everybody. Nope. We ate. Right? I mean, it is they sinned. 
Then the eyes of both, both, not just Adam, not just Eve, then the eyes of both were open. They knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. First, the immediate result, the immediate consequence that happens as soon as they eat the fruit. We see the wedge of shame and self-protection shove itself down between Adam and Eve. At the end of chapter 2, they're naked without shame. And and, um, that's that's a a picture, not just of physical nakedness, but there was nothing dividing them. There was no shame. There was no covering up. There was no need to hide in any way. But as soon as they ate, their eyes were open. Both their eyes were open. And their first inclination was what? What? Cover up, hide, shame, immediate. That's what the sinful heart does. It begins to self-protect, but it didn't stop. Division didn't stop at them. In fact, there was a bigger issue about to be revealed that we see playing out among them. The bigger issue is when they hear God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they normally would have run out to join him. And I don't know how that, I mean, a God that's everywhere, how they have to run out to join him. I don't get all that. We could discuss that. Um, I I would be very careful to make because it doesn't give us a lot of detail. But he's walking in the cool of the garden. Normally their inclination would be run to be with him. And what do they do? Hide. They need They didn't cover up with leaves to hide from one another. They sought to hide because they didn't want God to see them. Shame, fear, self-protection. So here they are. And this immediate consequence then plays itself out a little more fully when God pronounces his curse and he talks about enmity between the serpent, his offspring, and and, and her offspring. And he talks about this war that's going to start, this, this actual warfare, the enmity that God's going to start, this, this spiritual war that God starts and says, I'm going to do this. But then it plays itself out in, the, the, in between the man and the woman as well. When God says to the woman, he said, just Genesis 3.16, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. Now the curse is going to affect every aspect of their life that God had given them life for. Go be fruitful and multiply. The woman's going to have pain in childbearing, Right? Rule, exercise, dominion, all these things. You shall des- your desire shall be contrary. So, so the woman was created to be a help to her husband. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Rather than joy together in marriage, rather than being complementary to one another, they naturally become competitors with contrary desires, with forceful oppression to get his way. And this division didn't stop with Adam and Eve. We see it play out in every generation after that. Immediately, the very next relationship, we see Cain killing his brother Abel out of envy, out of jealousy. Because Abel has something that Cain wants. God's affirmation, God's approval. He received that sacrifice. Oh, yeah, man, that's a, that's a good sacrifice, Abel. Cain is fuming angry. What, what's wrong with mine? Right? Right? This envy, this jealousy that just burned inside of him. This is the way it's played out always, over and over and over. We need to know our sin natures. And not just ours, not just mine, but yours too. Let's be honest, let's be serious. I'm not trying to shame you, I'm not trying to hurt you. But your sin nature is as bad as mine, believe it or not. It's as bad as the person you're angry with. It's as bad as the person that's offended you. Your sin nature is just as bad. We need to know our sin natures. Is, it, it's given to prioritizing self, protecting self. It's given to disunity at the cost of self. The dis, di, division with everyone else so long as I'm okay. It's the default mode of the world. And if we're not careful, brothers and sisters... It can be our default operating system... And you see it play out when a husband sits down in a conversation with guys and belittles his wife, or, or the vice versa, the wife sits down with her girlfriends and starts talking poorly of her husband. 
Or when you get together with, with friends in the church and you start gossiping, saying things you would never say in front of someone else. Or when you walk up to someone and tell them something and you flatter them and you say something to them you would never say behind their back. We see that play out all the time. Because at work in every one of us is this way in which we build sides, we divide, we, we build teams and we seek to belong to a team. We self-protect and we self-exalt. We need to be aware of this. I mean, we, not, not, here's the thing. We're, we're surrounded by, by sinful forces that, if possible, would pull us apart. Sin and the sinful forces behind it are seeking just to, to have its way with God's people and to rip us apart. The, the vision is the work of the enemy. He's the one that went in and lied and brought this about. Like, he's the one, right? Now, obviously, they have responsibility. Adam and Eve have responsibility. They chose to eat. But this is his work. He'll do everything he can to keep us from enjoying the the unity that comes with standing firm and agreeing in the Lord together. But those forces aren't just external. There's forces within us that if we're not careful, if we're not keeping them in check, they will push us apart. We need to be on guard. We need to beware. We need to recognize this. And if there's a Yodi and Syntyche here, we need to be willing to step in. Seek to see that resolved. Because we are the church. We are the children of God. Unity is provided to the church in the Lord By the Lord. Unity is provided to the church in the Lord by the Lord. Paul's not calling them to something. Paul's not calling them to some standard of living that hasn't already been given to them. Stand firm in and agree in the Lord. This is the solution. This is the way, the path forward. This is the way to fix this problem. All the world can ever do is produce a veneer of unity, an apparent unity that isn't any deeper than what we can see. I think one of the ways I've seen that most clearly played out over the last few years is our love for, and if you do this, I'm not trying to ridicule you, so don't feel ridiculed. I'm just using it as an example. But our love for putting, I stand for this, or I stand for, I stand for this or that, or th- such and such, or so and so, I stand for, you fill in the blank, as our social media, Facebook status, or, or, or our, whatever that's called. I don't even use it enough to know, and here I am talking about it. Whatever that little picture is. What's that called? Profile picture. Thank you. So, so the most recent thing, you know, is Ukraine. And so you see a bunch of, I think it's blue and yellow. I stand for Ukraine. Are you, are you going there to help them? Are you doing something to make a difference? And I stand for, I think a few years ago it was France, and you're seeing the, the French flag kind of overlaid people's pictures. I, I'm not saying that that's wrong, but how deep is that? How substantial a difference are you making with that? You're making a statement, absolutely, certainly making a statement. Bringing light to, to, to the world, the, the issue that's at hand. I don't want to diminish that. But how deep is that unity? Will you give your life for it? Would you pour yourself out, sacrificially pour yourself out, as Paul was willing to do for these Philippians, sacrificially pour yourself out, give up everything about yourself for the good of the thing you say you stand with? Well... I can't, really, I can't really leave my kids right now and go over there and do anything about that. My money's pretty tied up in this, this thing right here. I can't really give right now. I mean, we do it. We, we, we do it. And I, and, and I know I'm, I'm picking a, a, a small thing. And I, again, I'm not trying to ridicule anyone. Please do that. Feel free to do that. I'm not going to judge you if I see it. That's not, that's not what it's about. It's just to show that this, the, the, all the world can do ever is provide this veneer that only goes as deep as we're willing to actually follow through with our actions. 
And you may be putting that stuff out there and you're willing to follow through with your actions. Absolutely. Let's celebrate that. But we do it in every aspect of our life. Everything social, political, legislative, in, in a land of law and order. In a land of law and order, there is a reality that our laws can, can um, keep some order and make us comfortable, but they can't actually unite us. If they did, we wouldn't need police forces. We wouldn't need prisons. We wouldn't have court systems because they don't really work. They can make us comfortable. They can help us learn to live together. And we, we even do it religiously and denominationally. And, and again, it's not all bad. Don't hear me say it's all bad. I understand why, why someone who has a charismatic view of the Scripture would not want to sit under the teaching of someone who doesn't have a charismatic view of the Scripture or sit in a church that doesn't express itself charismatically where they can go to a church that preaches Christ and His cross and they can express that and they can uh, appreciate that. I, I get it. I totally understand. I understand why someone who has a Calvinistic view of salvation, a Reformed view of what God has done through His Son to save before the foundation of the world and keep us safe till after the end of the world. I I, I understand why that person wouldn't want to sit under someone who has an Arminian view that says there's a prevenient grace that enables you to believe and that becomes your responsible all on your own to to do this and figure it out. I understand why those people wouldn't want to sit under that teaching. I get it. But what we run dangerously close to oftentimes in the church is when people don't align with every doctrinal perspective we have, jot and tittle, we then start saying that they're not Christian anymore or treating them as if they're less Christian than we are, saved by less grace than we are. And I would just say in a church that teaches from a Reformed soteriology, that undermines the grace of God in the gospel. (laughs) So don't let that be us. Or their methodology. You're not saying enough about this social issue. You're not saying enough about that social issue. You're engaging people that, that hold this view. Who are you to do that? There's a division now. Because you're going places we don't think you should go. I wonder what they'd have said to Jesus when he sat down at the table with sinners and tax collectors and drunkards. That's, we got to be careful. But unity is provided to us. The unity, the, the, the reason it's so necessary is unity is provided to us in the Lord by the Lord. The facade of fellowship, the veneer of unity, it, it can be undone, it can be pushed through, it can be uh, put, put aside for the, for the real, true fellowship, the koinonia, the partaking in, participating in God's grace in the gospel. The things of the world will never develop into this, but because of Jesus, as we look at him, as we agree in the Lord, as we stand firm in the Lord, this koinonia, this participating in fellowshipping becomes the natural result. The, the, Jason Meyer, one of the guys I've been reading through, he did the ESV expository commentary. Um, he, he makes this point. This exhortation is not an afterthought to the gospel, it is an application. Reconciliation is gospel application. When we believe in Jesus, when we keep our eyes on Jesus, this is the natural result of our life in in the church and among the church. The gospel is relevant for all of life, including personal conflicts. We are united in him. We are united by him. Now, I got more to say about that, but we need to add the second point so we can see it all work together. Unity is provided in the Lord by the Lord, Maintaining unity is the responsibility of the church in obedience to the Lord. Maintaining unity is the responsibility of the church in obedience to the Lord. And this is why Paul, again, doesn't ask permission, but he reaches out. You also, true companion, the word is Sisychus, and people disagree whether that's an individual whose name means true companion or whether he's speaking to the true followers of Jesus within this body of believers We know that he specifically calls out Clement, who would have known these women. He calls the whole church to this because it's not just an individual's responsibility for unity. It's the church's responsibility for unity. Disunity is the default position in the world. But the church, we're united in the Lord. He counts us as one whether we consider ourselves one or not. He's uniting us. But then we're responsible to put that to practice. Each of us are responsible to practice. And I'm going to show you how that plays out. I'm going to point you to Ephesians chapter 2, 
first and then Ephesians 4. Now, Ephesians is a unique book of the Bible in that it so clearly demarks between doctrinal sections, this is what we believe, to practical sections, this is what we do because we believe. I love it for, for discipleship and dealing with pastoral counseling issues and things like that because I think so much of it is fixed if we just get these ideas in their right place. But Paul, in Ephesians 2, verse 14, he's dealing with the fact that you got Jews and you got Gentiles, you got Jews and Greeks, and, and they're at odds with one another, and he's trying to show them how they're one people and how God has made them one and counting them one. He says, for he himself, this is Jesus, for he himself is our peace, who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus makes us one, right? Unity is in the Lord, And of the Lord, is in the Lord and by the Lord. He does that. He makes us one. But then, he turns around in Ephesians chapter 4, the very first list of commands that he begins to give in light of what he's taught. He says, I therefore, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The attitudes that he tells us to put on, humility, that's the only inward focused attitude. Humil- humble yourself, and then as you begin to act with, interact with other people, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. That's a radically different way than we oftentimes deal with one another in it. That's the attitudes. To this end, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So I humble myself. I treat you gently. Seek to. I'm I'm imperfect. You know that. I'm not trying to make excuses. Just reality. Patience. Seek to be patient. I hope you will be with me. Bearing with one another in love and holding up each other's junk, right? Our, our, our failures and flaws and, and the struggles. Bearing with one another in love. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I do all those others to see this done. And then he, he, he roots that again in the truth that we are one people with one God, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. That is a natural reaction. See, so, so, so if we bring that back into Philippians, we can flip back and say, look at Philippians and say, oh, well, wait a minute. He tells us to, to live a life worthy of the gospel and immediately speaks about unity. He teaches them to, to, to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. This is not an individual sport. This is a team sport. So, so practicing unity and, and pursuing unity in the church is practicing what the Lord has produced in us. He's given it to us. Unity is in the Lord, agreeing in the Lord, standing firm in the Lord. But it's our responsibility now to actually practice that thing he's producing. So he's done it, and we then do it. That's the, that's the whole idea. It's, it's not an individual role. It's the responsibility that belongs to the whole church. Alec Mottier, another commentator I've been reading from, love this point. He, he, he notes, the very existence of the need is of itself a call to come to the rescue. Now, the last time you heard somebody talking ill of someone else or noting that there was this massive division in between these people that you care about, did you note that? Did you recognize that as a call to come to the rescue? I I hope so, because we talk about unity a lot here, but, but the very existence is a call to come to the rescue, he says. Paul does not say to Yodi and Syntyche that they should ask the true yoke fellow for his help. The command is to him to make the first move. Uninvited, saved by Paul. And I don't know what happens when, they, when true yoke fellow Sisygus or Clement step in, and I don't know if they're like, what? Um, mind your own business. Right? I don't know if that's what they did. But Paul wasn't concerned about how they would react as much as the church stepped in to see the problem addressed. We are responsible to put to practice what the Lord has produced in us. He has clearly, we have seen it, it's all across the New Testament, clearly produced a one people. So we're supposed to act like it. We're responsible to act united, to fight for unity, to maintain the peace that he has produced. Right? That's, that's the idea. And now, now, here's the thing, and, and, and we got to get to this and just got to deal with it. 
If we're not careful, we're going to take this message and we're going to be all about unity. Let's make unity. Let's unite. Let's talk about it. Let's be one. My last point, and I think it's clear in this passage, is unity is produced by standing firm in and agreeing in the Lord together, not pointing at unity. So if our goal is unity, or if our goal is, let's just use a word we use a lot, community, we're going to fail. We're not going to arrive at that goal. Because as many people are sitting in this room, and one has a little bit louder voice because he's making decisions for people sitting in the room, alongside two other people, there's a reality that Every one of us have opinions about what that's going to look like, how that should be practiced, when we should do it, what, it, what are we going to do when we're together. We'll never arrive at it because we're a bunch of individuals, right? So then how do we do it? We, we, we have to recognize this. We have to realize this. Defaults are, are, are it's the fruit of running after ourself. But we've been given unity, so we're spo- responsible to live in unity. So then how do we get to unity? Stand firm in and agree in the Lord. That's where he points them repeatedly. I love you. You mean so much to me. You're my joy and my crown. I, I, you, I, my affections are so deep. My love is so sincere. Stand firm in the Lord. Yodia and Syntyche are disagreeing in the Lord. Their, their division with one another is not just a division between them. It's a di- disagreement in the Lord. It's got to be dealt with. Agree in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. We, we, we don't know exactly what was dividing them. We have no idea the circumstances. But the way back, the solution, agree in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. And that reminded me of a, a quote that, I don't know, it's been a long time since I've read this book, but Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. Uh, and this quote, and I see it every so often. I see it, and it just is such, it's so good. And I just I thought, you know what, this is, I think this is what Paul's getting at. But it's, it's, the imagery just speaks. I don't know why, but I just appreciate it. He, he writes, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which one must individually bow. Think about that. So 100 worshipers met together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God and strive for closer fellowship. I don't want us to be unity conscious any more than is necessary. I want us to be so focused on Christ we can't help but love and appreciate and prioritize and value the same one. That when we speak, there is melody. We're all in the same tune, singing the same song. That's beautiful, isn't it? And it's not about, hey, get this piano next to this piano and make them think the same and do the same. It's get this tuning fork, which is Jesus, and, 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 and be tuned to him. And, and, and conform your life to him and recognize the value he has for you and recognize how much he's done on your behalf and who you are because of what he's done on your behalf. And, 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 and let your life begin to reflect that and put into practice all that he's producing in you. And naturally, what's going to happen? This person over here that's doing the exact same thing, you two are going to begin to look and act and perceive and think so alike. So that you're not working at unity. You're just working at looking at Jesus. That's why a few weeks ago I will push without, without apology on all the little sacred cows that we like to set up in our church. Not just our church, but the church broadly. Nothing will fix or enable or empower us to live the life we've been called to live. Nothing will cause us to shine as lights in the world in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation as he talks about in Philippians 2, at the end of Philippians 2. Nothing will result in that other than us looking and valuing and wanting Jesus over everything else. I 
It's the natural. It's the fruit of, it's the product of standing firm in and agreeing in the Lord and not letting anything get in the way. And when he unites us, we get to see some of this. I, I wish I could deal with this in more detail. Maybe one day I'll come back to it. But, but he, he, he comes to this place where, where he shows them. Uh, united in this work of reconciliation. United in this purpose of keeping your eye on Christ and reconciling people, not to themselves, but to Christ. Agree in the Lord. Walk in Him and be one with one another. And, and then this final phrase. These fellow workers of mine, the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. We're united in purpose. We're united in values. We're united in mission. And we are united in hope as we keep our eyes on Him. And, and, and there was a phrase from Spurgeon's uh, notes on this that I just wanted to share in closing as we think about being united in Christ and united in hope. That I just thought, I'm going to close on this. Because I, I believe if, if, this, if we could all just get settled in this, then we'd be, we'd be much more able to rest in Christ and quit putting bricks on a wall that He tore down He writes, according to some learned commentators, a man's name may be in the book of life for a time, but it may be removed. If their teaching is true, that book will will be very much scratched and blotted. I thank God that I do not believe in such, such a book as that. If the Lord Jesus Christ has written my name in the book of life, in the great family register, we're one. We're in that family. And there's nothing that can change that. If the Lord Jesus Christ has written my name in the book of life in the great family register of the redeemed, I defy defy all the devils of hell to ever get it erased. Look at Jesus. Rest in the security, in the power that he's worked, in the presence in your life, in the value that he holds. Rest in him. And then just look up at some point and notice You're standing alongside many, many brothers and sisters who are resting in the exact same thing. And tell me you don't feel like you belong then. That's unity. That's the community we're seeking to develop. That's what we're chasing after. The only way there, the only path to this is standing firm in the Lord. It's agreeing in the Lord. So let's do that. Let's pray.